Let me tell you a little story. The story goes like this. In the world of professional wrestling, we have seen changes take place through the years. Whether it was the Gold Dust Trio back in the early 1920s, setting the standard for professional wrestling, whether it was Jack Pfeffer in 1933 revealing the secrets of the, of the world of wrestling to the local newspaper and ruining the sport for years to come into the Great Depression. The Dumont Network was what Reese uh, saved professional wrestling and put it back on the straight and narrow for years to come. But then, but then from there, everything was fine. In a wild, crazy world of professional wrestling, everyone respected the borders set forth by the National Wrestling Alliance and worked together to maintain the to maintain balance in the world of professional wrestling and control and they only cared about controlling their specific territories whether it was big jim crockett senior in the carolinas or or the war for georgia with the various promoters that were there before jim barnett or the fullers in in I believe in the Gulf area or Jerry Jarrett in Tennessee or the Von Erichs in Texas everybody respected their areas to the point of where even when the the boys were telling Fritz let's expand let's 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 move around let's let's you know grow world class Fritz said no because it would have broken the one golden rule that every promoter from Fritz's era set forth. And that one golden rule that it would have broken was you don't invade other people's territory. And that's exactly why, and that's one of the reasons why Fritz stayed in Texas. Now I know some people might think, oh well Fritz stayed in Texas because he wasn't, you know, because the Texas style of wrestling wouldn't have made it in other areas or something to that effect. But no. In a way, in a way, the Texas style of wrestling that goes back to the territories is similar to the style of wrestling we used to see in New Japan, the more strong style, style uh, the more strong style of wrestling that is very noticeable with people like Minoru Suzuki and Tomohiro Ishii. But Fritz didn't move. Vern didn't move. Bill Watts tried. But the oil crisis killed his chances. Jerry never did, but Jerry lasted the longest. Well, actually, Jerry Jarrett did, and that was a merger with Dallas, but I skipped ahead. Because for many decades, decades upon decades upon decades, and generations in some regards, saw wrestling in one way, and the one way that everybody saw wrestling was if you lived in the tri-state area there was only one wrestling promotion for you and that was the WWF or the WWF depending on when you were a fan. And the reason for that is there was no such thing as national television. There was no traveling wrestling shows where the WWF would go to the Carolinas or the Carolinas would go to Minneapolis or 
Minneapolis would come, or the AWA would come to Texas. There was no traveling wrestling shows. Everyone stayed in their region. Until one fateful day when all the peace and coexistence that laid in the land of professional wrestling all the harmony it went away when one of the major promotions started going through a facelift you see Vince McMahon senior was getting was ill I feel, I, if from what I remember, I believe it was either his kidneys or his liver or some, some body part was failing. And he knew it. So he sold this company to his son. And in 1982, Vince Jr. took over the WWF. It wasn't long before that that the old age, the old style was clearly not something Vince cared about. He wanted to take the WWF National and was going to do what it took to do it. Even if it meant starting a war. And that's exactly what Vince did. Vince went to every territory and plucked away talent plucked away television time. Whether it was Mike LaBelle in San Francisco, in, in, the Cal in California, whether it was Hulk Hogan by the end of 83 with the AWA, Gene Okerlund, Jesse Ventura, David Schultz, Roddy Piper, Junkyard Dog, Greg the Hammer Valentine from the Carolinas, Even though they came on their own, the Briscoes still made the move to the WWF. The fact of the matter is, Vince changed wrestling when he started going national. Because he made it where everybody believed that the only way to actually stay afloat was to compete with Vince. When in reality, the only thing you could have did to compete with Vince was done something different from Vince. But nobody realized that at the time. The person who realized that after the fact was Bill Watts, who went on record, who said in his book, you can't out Vince, Vince McMahon. You have to be different. It took many years for wrestling to recover because once Vince started going national, once territories like Central States and Missouri, like Mike LaBelle in, in California, Peter Maivia in Hawaii, Stu Hart in Calgary, Frank and Jack Tunney in Toronto, Once they started collapsing, once they started dis once territory started disappearing, the one question one question became clear: How long can wrestling sustain losing? The answer came at the beginning of the 1990s, when business finally hit a wall for the WWE when business started dropping for Jim Crockett Promotions after they after a flopped invasion angle with Bill Watts' Universal Wrestling Federation talent and the company being sold to Ted Turner after the television revenue that Jim Crockett Jr. was counting on coming in from the other markets like Central States, like Florida, like Texas, never came. What happens next? 
for years upon years upon years. Business was flat. And nothing could change that. What worked in the 80s wasn't working anymore. Hulkamania, Hulkamania in 1990, by 1992 was on life support. And needed a shot in the arm. It needed something different to bring it back to where it once was. The WWF needed something different to bring it back to where it's, it once was. The newly formed, or the newly renamed World Championship Wrestling needed something to bring it back to its glory days under Jim Crockett Promotions. But nobody saw the writing on the wall. By 1994, former third-string announcer Eric Bischoff had taken over television production for World Championship Wrestling following the departure of Bill Watts. It wasn't until 1995 that Eric Bischoff took over complete control as Executive Vice President of WCW upon the formation of Nitro. And it was the formation of Nitro and the debut of another, of another Monday night show that glorious September day in the Mall of America in Minneapolis that changed wrestling forever. Because for the first time, Since the territories, there was more than one place to go. There was more than one place to be, because there was more than one place where you could be on, where you could be on national television. See, it was different from the territories, because back in the territories, you were regional. But now, you could be national. This wasn't like the ter this was the first time that wrestling showed a sign of life since the territories ended. But it wasn't the first time uh, but it was something different because it wasn't like the territories. It wasn't like anything. Because this period that we're about to enter was unlike anything that ever came before it or since. Wrestling was about to enter another golden age. And it was going to be game changing. It was going to be revolutionary. And it's going to be continued in the next video. If you like videos like this, let me know in the comment section below. But if you don't want to leave a comment, feel free to leave a like. Subscribe to the channel for more content just like this that you can only find right here at Wrestling Express. Till next time. Later.